Okay, greeting students. This is Henrietta Newton Martin with you. This is the introductory class to insurance laws. And uh, today, basically, we'll be just be doing the introduction part of that. But before that, let me just tell you this being the first class, what are the, like, the terms that would be applicable for your class attendance? Um, for your attendance, as you know, it carries substantial marks. And, uh, you know, it's already posted in the course description in the Google Classroom. And also I posted in the group for all of you to uh, just go through it and understand what are the, uh, you know, the timings of the lectures. And uh, I mean, some of the lectures will be for one hour and some of the lectures will be for one and a half hour. That is one hour, 30 minutes. And of course, we are going to learn a very important subject that is insurance laws. And a little bit of uh, introduction about myself is, of course, I'm Henrietta Newton Martin, that you know. And uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to interact with uh, you all, Master of Law students. Um, and um, I'm a lawyer by profession. And um, I'm handling some other subjects as well at your university, but uh, for you, that is your class, Master of Law, I'll be teaching insurance laws. Now, uh, about the attendance, coming back to that, uh, this is very important for you to understand, as you know that it carries substantial marks. Uh, you will have to attend the class, okay? And it, there will be buffering time of five minutes. I wait for around five minutes, like from eight to eight, five a.m. for the students to enter the class and I will begin with the lecture. This five minutes, like we could use probably to even uh, to settle any doubts or to, you know, if you have any clarification, maybe I would provide you some clarification during this five minutes. Um, the next thing is at 8.05 sharp, we are going to begin with the lecture and um, I would allow any student to who, you know, uh, enter the classroom up to 8.15, that is 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, I may not allow the student to you know, enter the class or join the meeting. Now, the reason is because the first 10 minutes is, you know, a crucial time where we introduce the chapter to you. And during the introduction phase, it's important that a student understands the, you know, the outline of what we're going to learn during the next 45 minutes or, you know, the next 45 plus 30 minutes, depending how long the class is. And, you know, the duration of the class is already adumbrated in your course uh, module as well, in your course description as well, CDLS. Um, so that is the reason. And uh, I, I prefer a little bit of discipline and I'm here to cooperate with you. And uh, um, I uh, wish that uh, you provide me the same cooperation. And the subject is quite easy. There is nothing that is uh, tough. And uh, we'll try to make as best as possible, uh, you know, the subject as perspicuous as possible, as, you know, as easy as possible. So let us move on now, okay? So what is insurance? You all know, you must have heard about the term insurance and you must have heard about life insurance, marine insurance, motor vehicle insurance, and so on. What is insurance? Of course, you know that insurance covers risks. Um, every human being or in a society or in a structure, everyone is exposed to risk. And those risks may cause perils, may expose you to certain perils, like peril of or the threat of you know fire or the threat of accident or you know death and so on sickness so to cover such perils so cover such risks uh, insurance acts as a social tool which enables the insured that is the one who obtains the insurance policy to cover up the losses just in case he encounters any losses as a result of the you know, the, the potential or even a threat or a danger that he has been exposed to or that has manifested. So this is what insurance is in simple terms. It's a social tool. It's a legal tool. It's a social tool. It's a social legal tool, rather. Uh, 
Now, as you know, there are different types of insurance. There is life insurance. There is, uh, uh, you know, uh, insurance against theft. There is motor vehicles insurance. There is marine insurance and so on. The idea is that, you know, person and property are protected. And the concept of insurance is just not any new concept or something that has developed over, say, over 20 years, 30 years. I believe it has been existing for quite some time in the sense that uh, actually it is existing in some parts of the world from time immemorial and it is now concretized into laws, say for the past, you know, 60 decades or 50 to 60 decades, it has been concretized in the form of laws or codified laws uh, in different jurisdictions and in some part of the uh, parts of the world and now depending upon which part of the world it is. Like for example, in India, it has been existing from time immemorial in the sense like we could date back into the ancient times. And uh, it's, it started getting kind of shape and form in the form of codified law. It came around somewhere in 1950s. Uh, so it depends which part of the world you are in, which part of the, you know, uh, which is the jurisdiction that we are talking about. But here in this class, we are going to study the international perspective of insurance law as the basic concept. And uh, of course, laws, uh, you know, vary from country to country, but the concept of insurance remains the same. Now, let us, having said this, now let us move on to, uh, you know, to our slides. And uh, without wasting any time, we'll go through our slides and see what is insurance. And uh, we will go through the, you know, the important precepts of insurance. Now, having set the perspective for insurance laws and having said that insurance is a socio-legal device or socio-economic and socio-legal device, also I would say that to eliminate or reduce the risk of life and property. Now, again, reiterating that under this scheme of insurance, there are people who connect themselves to the insurance company who is also, uh, who can also be referred to the insurer here and who can connect themselves to share risk, you know, linked to a particular individual or a group of individuals. Now, again, before we move further to the slides, I want you to know that insurance today is governed by insurance contract. Okay, so there is a contract that is signed by the uh, by two parties basically who are involved here. That is one person would be called as the insurer and that is the insurance company and the other party would be called as the insured. That is a party who is getting insured. So they normally the insurance company undertakes in exchange for a fixed amount, which is called as premium, to pay to the other party on the happening of a, you know a particular event or particular uh, you know it could be an unforeseen it may be unforeseen event or an event which uh, probably it was impending that was uh, was really apprehended or something that could not be really seen. So therefore, today we are talking about insurance and in the legal perspective, we are going to talk about insurance laws, which actually speaks about the practices of law which surrounds insurance and covers insurance claims and policies because sometimes what happens is even insurance companies default in making payments and certain, uh, you know, companies, they have, uh, you know, always insurance company, as you know, they have a group of underwriters as well as they've got a group of uh, lawyers or a legal team involved there. And they try their best how to protect the interest of the insurance company and try their best how the insured is not, uh, you know, eligible for disbursal of any claim amount. So therefore, there are insurance laws to you know, set the right perspective and to regulate the practices of the insurance as a service sector or the insurance industry, as well as to render the rights of the people as a social economic tool. Therefore, insurance is regulated by laws, which are particularly aimed at, you know, uh, to put it in right words, assuring solvency of insurance companies. 
Now, this sort of regulation basically regulates in terms of policies or reserve policies, capitalization, or, you know, sometimes they have uh, different rates, percentages that needs to be devised and also back office procedures and insurance as you know it's a crucial tool it's a significant tool which basically provides sense and a sense of safety to the society as a whole now again i'm reiterating a particular point that has to be drilled into your minds that is what is the need of insurance of course to cover the risks which are unpredictable or which may be uncertain in nature so when you think of insurance, it is normally about covering of risks and risks pertaining to property as well as a person. So getting an insurance, for example, for an asset now does not imply that the asset has protection against risk or its exposure to risk is decreased, but it actually means that if the asset you know, is exposed to any loss in value due to particular danger that it may be exposed to, then the insurance company would carry the laws and compensate the insured, that is the policyholder, uh, you know, to compensate and make good the loss to him in the sense that you make some payment to him that, and you know, in the way that the, the person has paid premium and calculatively the insurance company would pay back, uh, you know, depending upon the loss and calculatively to pay back to the insured. So therefore insurance laws, if they act as an, uh, you know, effective tool a significant tool in promoting even investments or savings and also especially where these investments are pooled together and it also causes overall economic growth within a particular country. So now moving further with the slides, we will see again in a repetitive form again, you know, in a simple way, what is insurance? Now, as the slide says, in life, we inevitably come across failures or we hear stories of accidents, sickness, and the lows of human existence. I'm talking about the lows, the, the times where a person may be low in life or where the property is uh, you know, destroyed, where economically low a person is plunged into the lows of economic existence. So here we hear about miserable incidents as well sometimes. Uh, of destruction of life and property. Now, existence and sustenance of life inevitably involves risk. Such risks need to be covered and combated in case of manifestation of such risk to avoid deprivation and degradation of human sustenance. Now, to cover such risks, we will see what is a risk later, but to cover such risks, we, which have the potential to hamper personal, individual, family, or corporate finances in the form of financial loss or damage to body or property, insurance is needed, and thus this sector plays a significant role towards maintaining and building the society. Now, risk of course is exposure to peril. That insurance risk means a threat or a peril that the insurance company has consented to cover up in case of occurrence of that apprehended or unforeseen unapprehended risk or a peril. Now, there are uh, an elliptic range of happenings that are considered insurance risks. For example, say death of a person. Now, this would cover, uh, you know, that is an insur insurance risk. Death of a person is a life insurance risk covered under the life insurance policy. A motor vehicle incident is a auto risk, which is covered under auto or motor vehicle insurance, etc. So insurance sector, that's, what, that's how it comprises of companies that sell insurance policies and collect deposits in the form of premiums. So when the insurance policy holder, they make uh, you know, regular payments at periodical levels, it could be monthly or you may fortnightly, or it could be even once in three months. So they pay you know, deposits. So insurance company collects deposits from the insurance uh, policy holders. And those dep both deposits are called as premiums, which may be released at the culmination of the policy towards the end of the policy or an occurrence of particular risk which the policy seeks to cover. Now, what are the features of this risk? Now, how are risks examined to be insurable? Now, the question is, 
what kind of risks or what are the factors that are considered by the insurance company to decide whether a particular risk has to be insured by the company. One is it must be of value, whatever is going to be insured, it must be of value. Example, of course, every property has got some economic value attached to it, be it a car or a house to protect a house from fire or a car from being stolen or from accidents and so on. So the, 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 uh, the thing that has to be insured or the product that should be insured or whatever the subject matter has to be of value, it should be calculable and significant enough to be able to be calculated. Next is risk transfer. Risk transfer must be within an affordable bracket. Next is risk source to be insured must be characteristically straightforward and definable to the extent that it supports objective verification. And risk again must be unintended and assumable. Next is losses may be direct or indirect. Direct losses refers to destruction of the property or a person itself. Indirect refers to consequential loss as a result of direct loss. In case of damage to third party, that refers to liability risk where the loss is caused by the actions of the insured or the policyholder. So thereby, risks may be uncertain and unintentional where the concepts of probability and possibility they come to the fore. Now, how does this insurance work? What is the nature of insurance? Insurance could also be called as a risk management tool to hedge risks and losses or to, you know, to cover up risks and losses. So you can also call insurance as a risk management tool. So now listen here carefully. You could call insurance as a risk management tool I said insurance is also a social economic tool as well as a social legal tool. Next is we can view, you know, or to understand the nature of insurance, uh, uh, you know, we can just observe it or examine it in two angles. One is the societal angle and next is the personal or a private angle. So what is the societal angle? Societal angle in the sense, it is like you view it with the eyes of, uh, you know, the society or in what way it would benefit the society. From the social point of view or the societal angle, the risk transfer mechanism of insurance, it works in a way that it collects premium. I, I, as I said earlier, what is premium? I told you what is premium and explained to you what is insurance and that it is a social economic tool, a social legal tool. It's also a risk management tool. And uh, it collects premium from whom? From the, from whom does it collect uh, premium? That is, you know, where, again, I'm repeating it for you because uh, Rukia, you have joined it now. So, uh, you know, the insurance companies are also called as the insurers because they are the ones who are insuring the person. They are rendering insurance policy to the person. So, they pro what, how, how would they gather that amount? So, what is the mechanism involved there? Now, this risk transfer mechanism of insurance works in a way that it collects premium, that is a particular amount of money depending upon the type of insurance and the, the amount that is involved in the insurance. So the, the insured or the insurance policy holder is expected to pay a particular fixed sum of money during regular intervals. It could be, you know, uh, fortnightly, it could be even, uh, you know, monthly or even once in three months. It depends upon the type of insurance. So they collect premium in order to pool resources, means gather resources, and then they disburse them or they, you know, they give it to those who are part of the policy at the right time they need. So this is the social angle in the sense that the insurance, uh, you know, policy collects amount of money and then it tries to, you know, disburse it or provide it to particular people who are in need. Next is the personal angle or the private angle. So unfortunate situations are covered by insurance policies, we know that, and it also operates as a pecuniary tool. What is a pecuniary tool? That means an economic tool or financial tool. It's a something related to finances and money uh, would be 
uh, I mean, you could refer it to as pecuniary. So what is, like it, so we, we could say that it operates as a pecuniary tool to combat the blow of an unfortunate event that has impacted the life, body, property of the policyholder. So, so far we said that insurance works as what? What kind of tool? I said insurance works as a social tool. So you could add these points also under nature. Remember, though it's not mentioned in the slide, I don't think it's going to be mentioned in notes as well, which I'm giving you because it was prepared long back, but I'm just reiterating so that you understand now under nature, you could say that what is insurance? You have to always give the definition in case the question comes to you, for example, what is insurance and explain the nature of it. So you'll have to give me the definition of insurance. What is insurance? What are the concepts in insurance? And then you have to come about with nature and the points for the angles, the societal angle, the personal and private angle. And you'll also be uh, have you also have to be mentioning about uh, an insurance as a significant tool in the society? I um, mean, it is a socio economic tool, it is, it operates as a social legal tool, it operates as a risk management tool. And here we learned also now as that it operates as a pecuniary tool to combat the blow of unfortunate events that impact the life, body, property of the policyholder. Are you understanding me? Now, next is insurance schemes operate as, you know, bifurcated into insurance schemes into, uh, one minute. I, I think you're not able to see the slides. Okay, you can bifurcate it into, um, uh, you know, uh, never mind, it's not because uh, the thing is hiding it, no problem. So insurance schemes operate as a bifurcated tool. Okay, it's clear now. A bifurcated tool uh, in the sense that is bifurcated. Bifurcated means it, is, it branches out into two, that is into two, so into two parts. So it's bifurcated into social insurance scheme and private insurance schemes. Now, there is this concept of risk transfer as well, because insurance uh, policies and the concept of insurance basically revolves around risk and risk transfer. Why I'm saying risk? Because it covers risk and risk transfer. Like, to whom does the risk transfer? In simple uh, uh, you know, words, the risk transfers from the person who obtains the insurance policy, that is the insured, to the insurance company, where the insurance company, or the, he's also called as an insurer in this, in this transaction, so that is the insurer takes the, uh, uh, gets the risk transferred onto himself or itself, because it's a company, he transfers into the, you know, to the insurance company, where the insurance company assures the insured that in case of the manifestation of any of the risk or in case there is uh, you know the if if the insured is exposed to any risk then the insurance company would you know take over the risk and compensate for the loss that has occurred as a result of the manifestation of the risk or exposure to that particular risk so risk transfer therefore is a foundational precept it is a foundational precept you know it is a constitutional tenant of the most of most insurance transactions wherein risk transfer is a specific risk and is comprehensively outlined and defined and that defined risk is passed on from one party to another that is the insured and to the insurance uh, that is the insured and the insurance policy holder but from whom does it transfer it it's transferred from the insurance policy holder to the insurance company now, it is this company, insurance company, or the insurer who covenants to take the risk by executing the insurance contract and binding the insured and binds the insured to the terms of the policy. The next thing under the characteristic or the nature of insurance is that the, the insurance policy coverage must be real. Now, to explain this, uh, you know, concept, we could refer to the case of a Booth versus National in Union Fire Insurance Company. This is the citation, and you will have to, you know, give the entire citation and entire case law because this is a law paper. 
So 450 NJ, that means New Jersey. This is a US case, NJ, New Jersey. Super 400, 410. APP is appellate division. And the case, the year of the case, the judgment was passed in this case was 2017. So the court observed that the expectations of coverage must be real and objectively reasonable. So therefore, in assessing the reasonable expectations of the insured, then what is ex what is being expected by the insured? So the courts will consider communication regarding coverage between the insured or its broker, because you'll have even insurance brokers in between who will come and sell the policy to you. So what is the coverage between the insured or its broker and the insurer or its agent that relate to the insured's expectation whether the scope of coverage is so narrow that it would largely nullify the insurance and defeat the purpose for which it was obtained? And if the policies Unrestrictedly narrow coverage causes broad injury to the public at large, which requires court now to preclude enforcement on public policy grounds. So what happens here is that the courts also play the role of an interpreter and depending upon the legislation that here, of course, it is, a new, it is, it would abide by the New Jersey regulation, the New Jersey's insurance legislation that is operative there. So what the courts would do is it would try to strike a balance between the legislation and the insurance policy contract terms. And then it would interpret the contract and, you know, it would interpret the contract, it would interpret the statute, that is the law, and then come up with, a, you know, a plausible way of rendering justice. And what the courts are trying to say here is the expectation of the coverage must be real and it must be objectively reasonable. You're free to ask me questions if you do not understand any concept. Towards the end of the class, you can ask me questions. Now, the next part is risk pooling. What is pooling is gathering of whatever. So here we are talking about pooling of risk. So the factor of risk pooling, now what it is, it refers to the creation of large groups of similar risks. So they pool the risk together and then they define it and they come up with a particular, uh, you know, they calculate it and they come up with, you know, uh, devising premiums and policies. Next is what are the foundational principles of insurance? And this also can be covered under nature. And or you could write it under a separate answer if they ask you on the foundational principles of insurance. If a question comes to foundational principle of uh, insurance, then your introduction to this foundational principles of insurance should be the entire stuff, whatever we have discussed till now, including the nature. That should be the, uh, you know, the introduction part of it. And then you mention the foundational principles of insurance, highlight it, and then you go on to explain what are the principles on which. Uh, the concept of insurance and the legislations and the laws of insurance are, you know, are devised or how they are built. So insurance, the concept of insurance and the laws, they basically revolve around the underpinning principle of utmost good faith. So that was an introductory statement I made there. And utmost good faith is in law. Normally there is a Latin phrase uh, which is used for utmost good faith, that is, you know, uber me fide. And I'm going to just uh, write it in my notes as well for you so that you'll understand about uber me fide. Now, under the principle, the first part is insurable interest. This is very, very important because even in rendering justice, the courts have to consider the prevalence of insurable interest in any particular case even while the insurance company or the insurer decides to give an insurance policy to a person who wants it or to a company who wants it they first sit and decide upon whether the person has insurance uh, sorry insurable interest now what is this insurable interest insurable interest is used to describe this term is used to describe the nexus or the connection between the insured and subject matter of the insurance that is who is insuring it and what is the connection with the subject matter of the insurance like for example there is a car a owns a car and now the question is who has to insure the car is a insurance policy has to be in the name of a and suppose a is not available and b insures the car so on whom does insurance insurable interest lies? 
B is just the friend of A, but to, who's the owner of the car, so insurable interest. So the owner of the car has an insurable interest because he's the owner of it. He's paid the price for it. And in case of loss, who suffers the loss is the owner. Are you understanding me? So insurable interest is basically the nexus or the connection between the insured and the subject matter of insurance. But such an interest exists when an insured person derives a pecuniary, that is financial benefit from the continued existence of the insured object or suffers a financial loss from the loss of the insured object. I gave you an example, a simple example saying that A owns a car. And so it is A who has insurable interest in the car. So in case there is loss of car or theft of car or car meets with an accident, so who will, who will have to suffer the loss is the, the owner, that is Mr. A has to suffer the loss. So who will be uh, you know, granted an insurance policy is A because he has an insur insurable interest and not B or C, even if B or C is A's best friend. So a person is said to have an insurable interest in something when the loss or damage caused to the insured items would directly affect the person. So this is something very, very important or it's highly significant that you understand what is insurable interest because this is a basic principle that revolves around the concept and the laws and legislation legislations of insurance across the globe or internationally because there are so many countries and every country has its own law but the concept of insurance remains the same next is all insurance is based on the concept of wager this is again under insurable interest that that, that is the happening what's wager that's the happening of an unknown event you don't even know what is the event so it's based on the concept of wager so the courts have developed the concept of insurable interest therefore to constrain the concept of wager to appropriate it to a purposeful concept of legally covering pecuniary losses so thereby an insurable interest is a legal right to enter into an insurance contract. Now, a person or entity is said to have an insurable interest if the event insured against could cause the individual or a company a financial loss. So an insurable interest, this insurable interest is fortified in a valid contract or an insurable interest is fortified in a valid contract or I would say that insurance insurable interest is given shape in the form of words in a valid insurance contract. Because how would you explain insurable interest? It has to find its place. It's better that it find its, it finds its place in a, you know, a well-drafted uh, you know, insurance contract. So that exemplifies the right of uh, no, the insured, there's a word missing there, the right of the insured to claim for the losses incurred, which are covered in the relevant insurance policy obtained by the insured. I hope this is clear. Now, what I'm trying to say is just because uh, uh, it's important, I'm reiterating it for you, I'm repeating it for you. So this insurable interest, the concept of insurance, uh, insurable interest has to be uh, you know, explained in simple terms, fortified means it should find itself strengthened in the insurance contract, a valid contract, in a valid insurance contract. So now when it's mentioned there, it's, you know, it's amply clear in case of any dispute. So that exemplifies or it, you know, magnifies the right of the insured, that is the person who holds the insurance policy, it magnifies the right of the insured, that is it, you know, it kind of puts him in a better position to, to explain his claim, explain his right, saying that yes, I have an insurable interest in the policy and look at the clause also in the contract the insurance contract so it exemplifies the right of the person to claim of the insured person to claim for the losses incurred which are covered under the relevant insurance policy obtained by the insured now in the case of hyman versus sun insurance company again this is a new jersey usa case appellate division this is an appeal case where the court referred to another case that is the case of farmers mutual finance insurance company of georgia versus Pollock. Uh, 
uh, Georgia is in South Carolina, 52, you know, 3A, at the, it's again an appeal case, 603 and so on. So in this particular case, in the farmer's case, there was a particular saying or a particular observation by the judge. And this observation was quoted in Heyman's case. Heyman was his son insurance company. Now let's see what the court has observed here in the farmer's case, which was quoted in Heyman's case. Now here the court said that other courts have looked at insurable interest with respect to property as whether the insured has such right title, he will benefit, he will be benefited by its preservation and continued existence or suffer a direct pecuniary loss, that means a financial loss from its destruction or injury by the peril insured against. Next is the short mayor's case versus again, this is a New Jersey case as well, New Jersey Reality Title Insurance Company. It's a 2008 case where the court observed that the law's requirement that an insured, that is a person who holds an insurance policy or the beneficiary of the policy, that is, um, you know, like sometimes uh, you have life insurance policy and life insurance policy is like in case the person is no more, so the amount that is gathered, this particular premium would be accounted in favor of the, a beneficiary, say the daughter of the person or the son of the person. So a beneficiary, the beneficiary of the policy have a recognizable defined interest in life or property and prevents socially discouraged wagering arson or other destruction of property, limits indemnity to actual loss. That is, what, what is indemnity is, um, you know, is it, when you say to, in, when you speak of the word indemnity, that means to indemnify the laws. It is to make good the laws, to compensate the laws. So the limit of indemnity, that is the limit of compensation, is, you know, restricted to the actual loss that has occurred. So the insurance, uh, you know, company will disburse the amount that is equal to the loss that is suffered by the insured party. So, and reduces potential risk to physical well-being and life. So this is what Chartmiller's case, uh, that was, it was observed in Chartmiller's case. The next principle, very, very important principle, apart from insurable interest in insurance laws and the concept of insurance overall internationally, one is, of course, as I said, insurable interest. Internationally, I'm talking about everywhere it is possible. Every country normally follows insurable interest. Next is utmost good faith. Normally, Everyone understands in the insurance sector that insurance laws and the concept of insurance and the policies of insurance operate under the principle of uber memory fide. That means a, it's a Latin phrase for utmost good faith. Uber memory fide means utmost good faith. So insurance contracts revolve around the principle of utmost good faith, pro tanto, to the best extent possible tanto to the best extent possible, I'm repeating it, that to the best extent possible of good faith, to the highest level of good faith, utmost good faith. So it is necessary that all relevant material information has to be disclosed by both the parties to the contract. And the party who proposes insurance has a legal obligation to disclose all material facts that are relevant to the subject matter of insurance. So at most good faith or the principle of uberemi fide, that is a Latin word or Latin phrase rather for at most good faith. Next is insurance contracts are contingent contracts. What is contingent? Contingent means something that involves contingency. What is contingency? Contingency means some an, a future unforeseen event. It is based on the extrapolation of an unforeseen event or apprehension of was apprehension, the fear or threat of unforeseen event, an imminent event which is unforeseen, which is most highly probable, which may or may not be predict predicted, thereby there is something to probably to occur they, that they have referred to. So they will be referred to as contingent contracts. So is, there is a possibility of it happening. For example, contingent contracts, death of a person. Everybody knows it's going to happen. We do not know when, but it's better that somebody is covered by a life insurance policy that in case of death of a person, then the amount is disbursed to the 
beneficiary of it. So contingent contract, insurance contracts are contingent contracts and it will be dispersed on the happening of a particular event, which is unforeseen, uncertain, would not know when it would happen or what would happen. Even if, for example, fire uh, you know, insurance, marine insurance, accident insurance, insurance against accidents, motor vehicles. We, we do not always say that, yes, we want to meet with an accident, but it's just that to protect yourself against losses should it happen. Accidents could also mean that your car is just standing there. Somebody, yeah, I mean, there's no driver in the car. It is static. It's just parked there. And somebody else comes and, you know, dashes the car. And, you know, the car is damaged. So there are several insurances. Well, so it operates around the 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 principle of contingency. So, so far we have learned three important principles. One principle which you must know like you must know like you must know is one is the concept or the principle of Uber and Mifide. It's an internationally renowned principle of insurance. Everyone knows about this. And so you should be knowing about it as a student, as well as even if you're working or you're you know, even as a customer, as you know, the, a, a, a customer of an insurance company, you should understand that you know insurance laws, legislation, policies work around, revolve around the principle of open and fide, that is utmost good faith. Also, on the concept of the principle of uh, insurable interest, which is very important. It's a basic tenet. Insurable interest is. I would consider it as a constitutional tenet, the basic tenet of insurance laws and the concept of insurance as well. Apart from that, what is the next thing that we learned? Ubrame Fide, insurable interest, and contingent contract that is on happening of a particular event, the amount will be dispersed. Next is principle of indemnity. What is, in simple words, what is indemnity is to indemnify the law. So indemnity would be a clause in the insurance contract. There would be a contract that a person would sign and indemnity clause will be there. And normally indemnity clause is in most civil contracts. It's mostly available in every contract but it depends upon the type of contract probably some of the contracts will not have it but indemnity would find its place in mostly every contract mostly i'm talking about because i cannot give you some examples here because time is a factor and we are we we'll try to confine ourselves with insurance laws so the principle of indemnity basically it refers to making good the loss for the person in the sense that compensate the loss incurred to the insured. However, principle of indemnity in case of insurance, you know, does not apply to life insurance policy. Right? Because the question is, how would you make good the loss? Because life insurance policy operates around the principle of assurance rather than indemnity. So next is the principle of assurance. Principle of assurance is used in case of life insurance policies where the life insurer, that is the policy holder, plays a, 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 sorry, a pays a fixed amount as specified and as agreed in the contract. And such amount is called as a sum that is assured. Thus life insurance contracts come within the ambit of contracts of assurance. And when the amount is disbursed, it can be disbursed even to the beneficiary. Next is the principle of subrogation. The term may look difficult, but it's a very easy concept. Please uh, like, you know, give me your patient hearing on this as well. So principle of subrogation. What is the principle of subrogation? <laughs> Sorry, just running the table of my comfort. So, you know, principle of subrogation. What is subrogation? Subrogation simply means like taking over something let me put it like that it's taking over something where someone has to do something and somebody else does it in advance okay and the person for whom it is done again cannot claim it from some other person now in the insurance perspective you could call it uh, you know you could you know connect it to taking over of insur insured's right of claim now, what is there in insurance is normally we talk about claims. So in case of an event that is taken, they say, for example, an accident. So when there is an accident, there is a loss of that particular property. Say a, a motor vehicle accident, the car is damaged severely, and now it's time to go and claim from the insurance company. So now this insurance claim, okay, is sought by the insured from the insurance company. 
Now, say that there is another claim, uh, I mean, there is a court case as well. There is a case that is filed in the court and the party claims compensation as well and also makes a reference to, you know, insurance and that he must be covered. So what happens in such cases is what the law says, you should not be profited doubly. That is, you cannot be profited twice. You cannot be paid twice. So what the insurance, so how it operates here is when there is a case as well, so the lawyer would say that let us include the, another party, that is let us include the insurance company also as another party in the in the case. So the case is like, uh, like between A and B, say A's car is damaged, A is filed a car against B who is simple, I'll give you a simple example just for the purpose of easy understanding. A's car is damaged and B is the one who, you know, really hit A's car. So he files a case against B, okay. Now, the question comes of subrogation. So A says to the insurance company, I will make you a party in the case. I'll make you the plaintiff in the case. So you will be along with me. And so when the court releases money, it's to the extent of the insurance uh, uh, amount that you'd be disbursing or giving it to me, you can take it from the court when the court releases the amount. So what the insurance company would say that, well, okay, we are ready to pay you the amount. We are ready to release the, the amount that your policy assures you or promises to give you and make us a party in the case. So they will release the amount to the insured and they become a party in the case. So the case will be like Mr. A, one, two, example, whatever, ABC Insurance Company versus C, whoever has damaged the car or whatever. Are you understanding me? So this is how the principle of subrogation works. So let us again go to the slide as it says. In simple terms, when the insurance company disburses the amount to the insured and the insured tries to make a claim elsewhere, for instance, to the court of law, uh, uh, just before uh, uh, before I move further, I'd like to remind you, uh, even Rukia who's here, that in case we get disconnected, please join back again, okay? Because uh, this meeting runs, uh, you know, for normally some time, and after some time it gets disconnected. Uh, in case we get disconnected, please join back. The class continues. So. Now, in simple terms, when the insurance company disburses the amount to the insured and the insured tries to make a claim elsewhere, for instance, through the court of law, then in such a situation, the amount of claim will be subrogated to the insurance company, the insurer, that is, to the extent of the amount disbursed to the insured under the relevant insurance scheme. The next is the principle of contribution that revolves around the concept and the laws that are that the government insurance policies. What is this principle of contribution? It refers to the right of the insurance company, that is the insurer, to recover a proportionate amount from other insurance companies, that is insurers, under whose scheme the insurers come. This, now this happens if, uh, if the, you know, if the insured, that is the policyholder, has even other policies from other insurance companies. So thereby the insurers collectively under different policies would contribute to indemnifying the loss of the insurer. So this is the principle of contribution when the a person or a company has more than one insurance policy on the same subject matter. Next, the principle of proximate cause. This is very, very important again. All these principles are important because these are the principles which form even a part of the nature of insurance and it, it's, you know, there are the characteristic of basic features of insurance and important principles around which the concept and the legislation of insurance across the globe, it operates. There are different laws of insurance, different names are given to it, but the basic principles are these principles, what we are talking about. Next, the principle of proximate cause. Proximity is the closeness that we are talking about. What is the most closest cause? A cause of it. See, for an effect, there has to be cause. So that's called as causation. There is something called as causation theory. What is causation theory? It is the relationship between the cause and the effect. For example, cause is accident, effect is destruction of property, destruction of the car. You see, cause is fire, effect is destroying the property. 
the house is void. Example. So the concept considers the cause of the loss that is most proximate. That is, what is the closest cause to the loss? Now, this happens when there are other supervening factors and there are other factors which are evolving, and there are many reasons how the damage has been caused. So that is where the insurance company would play an important role here, mind you, listen carefully. They will want to see how, you know, the lawyers there would see that how they will, uh, you know, protect themselves in the way that they do not want to really, you know, honor the claim of a person or they do not want to really disburse the claim because they work in the best interest of their own insurance company. So they see that whether the person is really entitled to, in the sense, whether the policy covers the cause. Let me give you an example here for you to understand this entire thing. Like say, for example, say for example, uh, you know, A, A has a life insurance policy, okay? A has a life insurance policy. And uh, okay, let's not say life insurance. Let's say A is driving a car. A is driving a car and there's motor vehicle uh, accident there. And, uh, you know, and plus he has a life insurance policy as well. And he's saying both well, motor vehicle policy and life insurance policy. And uh, A meets with an accident. And uh, as a result, he dies. So further, they say, further, they say that uh, okay, there's a question of claim now. A's family goes and claims from the insurance company. So the insurance company says, okay, the life insurance part is okay. The motor vehicle insurance says that, well, we cannot really uh, disperse the amount to you because uh, you see A has died because in the pursuit of, you know, the, obviously there is hospital, the, the person is taken to the hospital, there is a report, medical report which is uh, initiated and generated and the medical report says that the person has died due to a heart attack. And uh, really there are not much bruises to the body of the person to the extent that it would, uh, you know, it would really cause the death of the person. So what the motor vehicle insurance people would do is normally they would try to, uh, you know, shun away from the responsibility of disbursing this amount and they would come up with a defense saying, no, we are not really entitled to pay the amount. The reason is that the person has died of a heart attack as per the medical report and not really as a result of the accident and so on. I'm just giving an example. So the question here is what is the most proximate cause? Whether it's a heart attack or the accident. But the answer to this is the impact of the, the impact that the accident has had upon him is that it has given him a shock and that has given him a heart attack. Are you understanding me? So what the courts are just giving a simple example, okay? Not don't take it literally, but just trying to explain to you about proximate cause. So in this case, what they will do is they will try to really ascertain what is the closest cause for the loss that has occurred. What, the loss itself or the loss that has occurred in order to conclude on the disbursal of the insurance claim. So if loss to an insured party is a result of two or more concurrent causes, the two or more causes, like I said, maybe a heart attack and an accident and so on, has occurred in succession, that is one after the other, or it has happened simultaneously concurrently together, such a situation mandates or necessitates the examination of the most proximate cause. That is, they'll have to examine, to study, and to find out the most proximate cause out of the several underlying causes of the loss. And claims in which the losses are remotely connected to the cause, that is, they are not, they are not closely, but farly connected, would not be taken under consideration but what is proximately connected and it's part and it is under which the policy is covered, it will be accepted. But which is remotely connected and not uh, really there as part of the insurance policy, that would be rejected. So this is the principle of proximate cause. Next is the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers is an interesting principle which covers insurance policies collectively of a group of policyholders. And this was, was also called as a law of averages. More clearly, the law of large numbers refers to the statistical axiom, which states that the larger the number of exposure units independently exposed to the loss, the greater is the probability that the actual loss experienced will equal expected to the loss that is experienced. So this was actually like mentioned in international risk management by the International Risk Management Institute online in their in their website. I've taken it from there from www.com irmi.com so basically law of large numbers is an interesting principle which covers insurance policy
Next is the principle of adhesion. What is adhesion is normally where you draw right from without, you know, without negotiating the terms. Like you have to adhere to the, the policies. You have to adhere to the terms of any particular policy. So insurance policy normally are contracts which have these, you know, bracketed policies or they have this, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it rigid, no, it is flexible, but I would rather call it as policies which need to be adhered to, which has to be followed by the policy holder. So insurance policy also, insurance, uh, you know, the concept of insurance also revolves around the principle of adhesion in the sense that they have principles or policies or clauses in the policies which need to be really adhered to, which has to be followed and which cannot be negotiated. Next is the principle of fortuity. And fortuity in the sense, this is an inherent factor. It is a part of insurance. So it implies that the inherent factor of any insurance bargain is to interchange a risk of future probable impending loss for the certainty of a premium. So this is the principle of fortuity where it, you know, it fortifies, it, it, it really supports the interchange of risk of some impending loss or probable danger in exchange of a particular fixed amount that is normally paid by the insured to the insurance company. That is an inherent part of insurance. And what is this insurance policy? So in Flommerfeld versus uh, Cardial, or the court observed that an insurance policy is a contract enforced as written when, when its terms are clear in order that the expectations of the parties are fulfilled. So as per this, all contracts and laws are subject to interpretation. As I said earlier, I spoke about interpretations by the court and insurance contracts are interpreted by the courts of law in insurance cases. Insurance policies being contracts of adhesion are construed or interpreted liberally. And contracts of adhesion, as I said, that is certain policies which are there as part of insurance contracts, they are not really flexible in nature. They need to be adhered to or followed by the insurance policy holder. And 